my friends. I am Vivian McPeak, and this is Ham Present. If you have feedback, would like to suggest a guest or topic for Ham Present, email me at hampresent at gmail.com. Rick Cusick has one of the most unique professional portfolios in the modern cannabis industry. He has worked on the top tiers of media, commerce, culture, and cannabis activism for 25 years. Best known for his 18-year tenure at High Times Magazine and HighTimes.com from 1998 to 2016, including infamous turns as ad director, co-editor, and associate publisher and spokesperson, Rick has appeared on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, Entertainment Tonight, CNN Business Report, The Bill O'Reilly Radio Show, CNN Business Report, Huffington Post, Live, The History Channel, and many local television shows, radio programs, and cannabis-themed podcasts. Rick has published over 200 articles, essays, columns, and interviews relating to cannabis and cannabis law reform. Rick has also served on the board of directors of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws for 11 years. And Rick holds the distinction of being one of the only people I was ever willing to hand the MC microphone to at the Seattle Hemp Fest main stage for many years. And he's with us today to tell us more. Welcome, Rick, to Cannabis Radio. I am very pleased to be here, Vivian, and I am very proud of that uh, that um, distinction I have of having the uh, microphone at your discretion. Let me tell you, nice. that's one of the best times of my life, man. Absolutely. Right on, bro. We, we might even touch on that. We have, we have so much to cover in a short amount of time, so I'm just going to dive in. You spent many years Go at High it. Times Magazine. High Times yep. has had many incarnations, but the most recent one's getting a lot of attention. What, what are your just general thoughts on High Times Magazine post canvas legalization? Uh, could you just give us a quick rundown? Yeah, well, my thought is, I mean, I have a very specific uh, viewpoint of the whole thing. Um, in 2016, it changed hands. Uh, when Michael Kennedy passed away, I left at that point as well, total coincidence, uh, and um, went to California. And shortly after those two events, uh, High Times changed hands into a corporate ownership. Before that, it was a there was a corporation, but basically it was a, a family. Two families ran High Times, and they were my bosses for all those years. So for me, High Times divides between the family of High Times, the hat that the people who ran it and the corporate people. Now, since the corporate takeovers of high times, um, there's been several different owners. I've known none of them. I left literally four weeks before they, every, the first corporate people showed up and um, I know none of them. So I can't speak personally about it, but I will say this. Uh, they've been in the news now. Um, they're apparently are defaulting on their loans. Um, that's what was in the news. Uh, it's been reported they owed $28.5 million on the street. And I can say for a fact that when I left High Times, we owed some money, but it wasn't anywhere near $28 million. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, corporations have a tendency of uh, not thinking of High Times as a cannabis magazine, but as a corporate entity. You know, is this something you, can, you right. can push around on the table and do it that way? And uh, honestly... Um, my feeling is, uh, I always thought that was going to happen. It's kind so, of symbolic you know, when, of the greater. It's kind of symbolic of the greater cannabis industry these days. Am I wrong? Yeah. Not only is it symbolic for me, it's a very specific metaphor. I mean, the people who I worked with at High Times up to 2016. Now, there's a lot of criticism all over the years about High Times, but I can tell you, the people I worked with 2016, we cared about the cannabis legalization movement, and we did a lot of things towards it, and. Uh, and I think that after that, and probably unavoidably, uh, corporate people came in and they don't care about cannabis, not really one bit. To them, it's a corporate, uh, it's a piece of, uh, you know, chess game. The S in cannabis and, is a dollar uh, sign for them, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a dollar sign for everybody. And I, again, I want to stress this. I'm not so critical as a lot of other people. I always expected that. Mm -hmm. I never thought that that one day the corporate people would come in and they would, you know, Bob Dylan said money doesn't talk, it swears. <laughs> I'm sure one day money was going to come in and swear and take over what was our uh, movement to legalize cannabis. And in a way, that was kind of a goal, right? Because that would be that's success. exactly what we wanted. <laughs> and, <laughs> be and careful also, what you want. Uh, put it well, to put it in context from my personal self, I got involved in this not really to start uh, a cannabis industry, although that I'd certainly worked on that and I was a big part of it. But I got started because I wanted to keep people out of jail. 
I did the jail when I got started 25 years ago. The jail figures were horrendous, and that's what got my attention, and that's what made me start writing about cannabis in the first place. And um, you know, pretty much, I mean, people's lives Ditto. are still being ruined by cannabis. Ditto, lives, sure. Ditto bro. When but, people tell me that but, cannabis is legal, I, I bristle. You know. Yeah. Oh, it's like legal. It's not, and you know, it'll never be completely legal. Um, after uh, alcohol prohibition, there was a couple of states. Utah, for many, many years, was a dry state. They just mm. wouldn't do it, mm. and uh, and that was true all the way up until the nineteen eighties or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, I think there will always be dry states regarding cannabis. Um, and fine, do whatever you want to do. I just don't want people to go to jail anywhere. Anywhere. So, 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 Rick, even, you even were in the upper, it. you were in the upper echelon at High Times at a pretty exciting time at its development. Yeah, what, the best what, time. What was, what was that like? Dragged it over the line and won, man. What was it like <laughs> being in the media spotlight for one of the most notorious and infamous magazines in America? Yeah, it was. Um, sometimes it was terrifying, and every day it was exciting. It was the, obviously the best job I ever had in my life. Um, right. I was, I considered it a privilege that every day that I was able to do anything like that for a living, <laughs> much less a really good living. And uh, and you know, it was. It came along at a time, as you know, I had I was a single dad with a daughter, and my daughter and High Times came along exactly at the same time. So I was hit with two very overwhelming things at the same time. And uh, High Times was, uh, you know, uh, the best professional experience of my life. And, you know, to answer your question in a larger fact, in a larger context, um, what I saw about cannabis legalization over the 18 years I worked at High Times, we did everything we did to, you know, to call the people to arms and, you know, get the thing done. And all of that helped, and every bit of it you know, contributed a million points of light, right? But we didn't really win anything until 51% of the American people were for the legalization of marijuana. Mm-hmm. And when I started in 1998, it was 35%. And more or less, you every year, it means one point a year, one mm-hmm. point a year until, 19, until 2010 when we had 50%, and then we gained three points the next year. And then two points. Well, you know, after that. I think that you're, I think you're four years older than I am. When I was, I was 16 years old when I got in 1974, when I got the first issue of high times and, and yeah, and I was the first one <laughs> changed my life. You know, I mean, it changed yeah, my life. Me I mean, too. I was addicted to it. It was just like, Oh my God, I can't believe there's something like this. This is me. This is my people. This is my culture. Um, and That's so I, I was right there. So you're probably right there. And so, yeah, I can imagine, but you know, all of a sudden, here you are at the helm of the thing. But you, ever, been, you know the 70s show? You ever see yeah. the 70s show? You know, they get high in, in the basement, right? Uh, I was that guy. I was exactly that age. I was in Mark Pack's basement. I was get his mother's basement. I was getting high. And this other guy, Mike Young, came in. And he said, hey, look what I got. And he held up the magazine. I said, what's that? Because it's a magazine about weed. I said, get the fuck out. And so he gave it to me, and I literally read out loud confessions of a lady dealer while we sat around and smoked a bowl. It was like and the Playboy I... magazine of stoners. You know, I, mean, I spent more time scouring that magazine than I did my dad's Playboy collection. That, right? And you hit it and under your bed so your lot. parents couldn't find it. <laughs> That's, That's right. That's right. It was exactly. <laughs> and you know something? If you look at the actual structure of the magazine, it was taken off uh, Playboy. It had a, an upfront form and had an upfront letter. Had a fold out. Yeah, every, and it had, and as God knows, it had a sense. Weed porn. <laughs> yeah, you know, Tom Prasad, the guy who started High Times, he was the first person who looked at, you know, a desiccated bud and said, that is beauty, and people would pay to, to see that. And it was a really, it was a big uh, leap, because think about all the bud shots. Think about all the bud imagery we've had, you know? Nobody ever thought about putting that you know, in a frame, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, and, and bringing attention to it until Tom had, uh, he didn't do it in the first issue. He did it in the second issue. Oh, it was, it was a parent and a DEA agent's worst nightmare. And, and of course, you know, <laughs> you guys were under scrutiny. We only have about 20 seconds uh, till the first yeah. break, but I just, you know, want to thank you for what you did to help us get to this point, my brother. Oh, you too, baby. And I can't tell you, uh, meeting you guys out there was like meeting my family on the West Coast. <laughs> and uh yeah i'm very proud of everything we did together it's great and we're doing it right and we're doing it right now 
Um, as I often say in this show, it's time to roach the segment, but we've got a big fatty second segment rolled up, so don't go anywhere. Time to roll out for the people that let us have present. Hang loose. We're coming right back. We're back for the second segment with Rick Cusick. Rick, knowing you for all these years, I've been very aware of how important being a parent has been for you. So important that you've written a book about it uh, called Reefer Dadness. Why did you write the book and what can you tell us about it? Well, why did I write it? Because uh, somebody once told me, if you want to write a book, it should be a story only you could tell. And that's pretty much a story only I could tell. Um, as I just mentioned before, I got my job right around the time Dylan was born. And uh, my wife and I broke up shortly after that. So I raised her pretty much on my own. And um, and I wrote this book a lot of uh, 10 years ago. I wrote it full book called reefer dadness which is all about how to keep out of jail and still tell and tell your kid about weed you know it's more a cautionary tale of parents and as i wrote the book things changed <laughs> and now it's a celebratory book uh that starts with the day my daughter got is born and right after that i had to get a job so i got one at high times and it ends with my daughter 22 years old and god's own stoner and uh <laughs> yeah and and a happy happy uh, woman at that. And my daughter is awesome. And uh, I was to be honest with you, I kind of did it from the hip, and I was worried that I was making mistakes, you know, because I, as you know, I traveled with her to everything I did. So she was kind of like the mascot of the marijuana movement for a while. And uh, but no, she's turned out. I couldn't be more happy. And um, it was a, an adventure bringing her everywhere. Um, you know, she was every year we came to Seattle, every year she came on the road with me and talked in the colleges. Uh, she came to the normal conference every year. I never, kept her, I never took, yeah, well, she, she learned and, uh, she learned to, you know, it's funny. Um, she didn't smoke pot until she was 18 and she told me minutes before she did, I'm going in that room now and smoking marijuana. And I said, well, why would you tell me that? And she said, well, I just didn't want to mess with us at all. I said, no, okay, you're, you're fine. And, uh, but she waited until he was 18. And so I said, why? And she goes, and I didn't want to get you in trouble. Oh, yeah. that's, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you were had the same situation as me or, you know, yeah, my dad's the hemp fest guy. <laughs> my dad's the high times guy. It's like yeah. The coolest, oh, yeah. The coolest yeah. dad in the world. Right. <laughs> yeah, or not, depending who you're talking or, to. Or one day yawn, yawn. Yeah, but that's a hip best guy, right? Because my kids are totally unimpressed by it. They're just they're saturated with it. Yeah, that's true, too. My my kids are good. Well, now she found out that within her own cohort, they were impressed with it. So my daughter was suddenly impressed with it for their sake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she told me, you'd appreciate this. She said, I wish we were still going to Seattle Hemp Fest, Dad, because now I'm smoking weed. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we're gonna have to put another one together, man. Um, yeah, just and that's that a whole reason, nother. Though. That's a whole nother story, and let's not get into that. Um, yeah. it, it, it feels <laughs> we got a couple minutes. Uh, well, we actually have more than a couple minutes. It feels as if every other celebrity has decided to get involved in the cannabis industry, which is, you know, yeah. on one on one hand, a powerful normalizer, uh, and also a sign of just kind of how far we've come that they feel comfortable doing that. Uh, and it's of like course, hundred now. Yeah, yeah. And you were at one time working with uh, Whoopi and Maya Medical Cannabis, and the Whoopi in that is Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, give us the 411 on that 420. Yeah, um, uh, it's in the book. Uh, Whoopi I, and I, uh, one day I got a phone call at work, and I said, Is Rick Cusick there? And I said, This is because this is Whoopi Goldberg. And I said, Whoopi Goldberg, the comedian? And she said, Yes, it is. And I said, No, it is. And I met Whoopi Goldberg once, and she said, And your daughter wore a top hat. I said, "Oh shit, you are Whoopi Goldberg," and she wanted and she wanted tickets for the cannabis cup for her family. Anyway, she turned out to be live away about a mile from my house, and we became friends. We were friends for about a year, and then she asked me uh, to see if I could find some people for her to to uh, start a cannabis company with. And I found Maya, and uh, I introduced them, and uh, they got along so well. And I thought she, Whoopi and I were going to start a cannabis company together. And uh, I was working on that. And then I introduced Maya to her. And this is a funny story I've never told publicly before. She, Whoopi excused herself, walked upstairs, came back and said, I just spoke with my mother. Her mother died in 2008. <laughs> and her mother told her to call the company Whoopi and Maya. 
And uh, so Maya and Whoopi became partners, and I, we three of us, along with Evan Nissen from Nissen Co., we co-founded uh, Whoopi and Maya Medical Cannabis for a menstrual discomfort, mm-hmm. and it was very beloved by the uh, by the people it was meant for. And um, and in 2018, because of all the Michigas with the legalization in California and eliminated the medical uh, uh, the laws and such. Uh, put a lot of strain on the company, and we had to close down the company in 2018. But mm-hmm. there's still hope that it might come back. We'll see. Is Whippy a stoner? But, uh, is, is Whippy a, an imbiber of the fiber? Yeah, yeah. Well, she's been way back. You know, way back when uh, she's exactly my age, and uh, she has, uh, like myself, gone to all the drugs over the years, and then sure. she settled in on cannabis, and uh, and then she uh, she got glaucoma when she was in her fifties and oh, wow. pretty much she became a, uh, a medical patient uh, at that point. Mm-hmm. And uh, she used a, uh, um, a, a pen and called it her sippy. And she knew that she talked about it on the view and everything like that. Right. Right. And, and yeah, yeah, I guess I missed that. And, I don't watch the view regularly. I never watched it ever. I still haven't, <laughs> but, I mean, uh, but yeah, no, she's, she's an A-lister and she's, oh, yeah, when you no, get involved she's... with Whoopi, Oh, well, she's a defender, a, a defender of democracy these days, a defender of truth, justice, and democracy, man. Thank God for it. Um, I mentioned in my intro that for many years when I was the MC, the Seattle Hempfest main stage, the Share Parker Memorial main stage, you were yeah. one of the few people, one of the few people, like maybe one out of two or three people that I trusted yeah. to hand the MC work over to. What are your thoughts on Seattle Hempfest and your experiences on its main stage? Ah, Jesus. Well, first of all, I still can't let, I still can't believe you let me do all that. (laughs) Because because honestly, I don't know if you remember this, but I did it for 10 years. I came to Seattle for 10 years. And that first year I was supposed to get up and do a three minute speech. And I was terrified. I was terrified. And and I forget the woman who was, she was um, on the stage and she gave me a little help and talk and stuff. And I did it and it was cool. But then um, I realized on the not on the main stage, but on the ceiling stage, I went there and I wasn't terrified then because I realized this is just rock and roll, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I used to be in a band. So I got up there and I, I no longer made a speech. I got up there and went T H C Seattle, and I went you know. And so suddenly they responded. And the next year you asked me if I would I would be the uh, the main stage and help you out, and then we did it and. Honestly, you know, I mean, first of all, as an activist, to have that forum mm-hmm. and to have, you know, to get up there and to be able to, to talk to that many people and, and, and with the passion that you've always wanted to, and it comes back to you from that crowd, geez, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it's you, what you guys created there for the many years you did, it was a miracle. And when I say that, I mean, like, there was never anybody hurt. There was never any, any real problems in that regard. There was never, and you can't put that many people every year together without something happening. And it never did. It was kind of an and, oasis, and, you know, to, to have hundred thousand people year after year after year. And then we've never had a serious in, injury accident or arrest. Nothing. I mean, it's a testament. Nothing. It's a testament that, that they say about cannabis, the prohibition was lies, right? I mean, if that was an alcohol fest, it'd be, chaos oh my god well first of all yeah we you know when we had the cannabis cups domestically you know we had the we had a big question about whether to have alcohol at those things and mm-hmm. at first we didn't and then we had to because they became really big and they became something else and uh and then of course fights happened not a lot but you know that that's what it came in so now the settle hem fest did so much for the movement for in so many ways but mostly because it, of its staying power Every year, you know, I said that one point a year, that one point a year, you did your part every year to make that point happen. And, and every, and as high times, you know, we talk about the, the value of certain things, high times, you can talk about this or that, or what you agree with it or disagree with it and all of that. One thing it did for the marijuana legalization movement is it appeared on the stands every year for 40 years. I mean, every month for 40 years. Mm-hmm. 40 years. And so for 40 years, people would be reminded and, and stoners would be, would be happy to go out and get it. And people would be reminded high times are still here, still here. And, and, and every year, every month, you know, you had to, uh, people who bought it every month 
kept it like it was gold and people who like cops and things like that, they would tell me, is that still work? Is that still around? Yeah, it's still around. We ain't going nowhere, buddy. And, I, and I'm very, <laughs> very proud that I can say that I was a high times freedom fighter of the month, high times freedom fighter of the year. And uh, listed yeah. Rinspoon Lifetime Achievement Award winner. That's a big one. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. I think That's I think that one. most or all of that was during your tenure. Yeah, yeah, it was. I I, I actually founded the Lester Grinspoon Award. Uh, my man, I, I got it right yeah, behind me. You can't see it, but it's literally right behind me on my desk. And uh, and the other thing that's right behind me is this segment because we got to go to another break. We're going to come back with our final explosive segment with rick cusick time to roll out for the people that let us have present hang loose we're coming right back we're back for the final second segment with rick cusick author of reefer dadness coming out very soon um rick i'm just curious what what's your characterization of the cannabis industry today do you like the state legalization models we currently have where do you think we're going in terms of policy and industry and then whatever else you'd like to leave us with yeah, well, you know, the industry, first thing, um, I was in media and I was in activism for years and uh, in business. I was a businessman at High Times. And I went out to California to start a California company, a medical cannabis company, thinking I knew everything there was to know about cannabis. And I went out there and I started the medical cannabis company and I found out that I knew nothing about cannabis. <laughs> nothing. And I, had to, and I had to start all over again. So the industry is an animal unto itself. And um, it has its own lifespan and its own problems. Um, I think that we all have to take a step back and wait a couple of years for everything to settle down. I think when the first time we get these legalizations happening, um, you know, everybody, you know, it was a big deal. And all the enemies of cannabis who certainly never went anywhere, they all got involved in the regulatory process and the regulatory process started sucking. And, uh, that's going to be a lot of that. It happened in New Jersey where I live. People ask me, how do you like the law in Jersey? I was the director of New Jersey Normal for 12 years. I said, how do you like the, New Jersey, the law in New Jersey? I said, I don't like it at all. There's no, there's no cultivation. But I'm really glad it's legal. And the, and the weed that we're smoking in New Jersey is pretty, pretty good. So that's a possible thing. But in, in five, ten years, five years, we will have cultivation. In the next, everything here is going to happen slowly. And if we think it's going to happen fast or overnight, you're wrong. Everything we've ever gained in marijuana legalization has happened incrementally in baby steps. And so take the long view. And unfortunately, uh, corporations and industry will be exactly that, corporations and an industry. And it won't be anything like what we had before. Mm. Now, what we had before was a heartwarming movement within our, within it you know we all knew each other and it was we were we were fired for the goal but these new people coming in they're going to be fired by the bottom line yeah it's in my feeling it's it's a it's it, the, the things that we lose uh, we we have to do this because it's too important to, to to get rid of prohibition but there's a lot of good stuff lost that i feel you know, as an old yeah. stoner, there's a, a consciousness, the cannabis consciousness that that, you know, I feel like it's going to be turned into beer to some degree. And there's nothing we can do about that. And it's a part of legalization is mainstreaming it. Yep. Uh, yep. And un I unfortunately, think probably happened. Go ahead. I, I said, I think that probably happened with alcohol when when alcohol, I think there was a culture of of uh, prohibition. That, you know, we think of it as like gangsters with Tommy guns and such. But I bet you there was a good, warm culture of people who like to drink all over the country that got their drinks no matter what the law was. And that that culture that went for 10 years during Prohibition probably fell away. Uh, I'll, I think he asked me to tell you something uh, I might want to leave you with. This is kind of weird. It's off topic, but not really. I used to work at the Edison Museum in the, uh, the um, documents department. We were going to all the Edison documents. And uh, I found a, a note, an intern office memo, and it was uh, the Edison secretary. And she said to this other guy, person, are you coming out to the house on Long Island in the weekend? If you do, it's 1924. And he said, if you do, don't expect to be able to leave S period, O period, B period, E period, R period. Super. <laughs> now, I'm sure to you that that acronym is something that was a code. That was that like 420 that was lost once 
Budweiser came along. And it probably meant something like so ossified behind, be, beyond every recognition or something like that, <laughs> you know. But I think that that's what happens is that the cultural people come in and then the lawyers and the business people follow. Mm. And thus has it ever been so. Think about rock and roll. Yep. Well, you know, we, we are, we're, we're fighting uh, to preserve this culture. And, and that's one of the things that this show and Reefer Dadness, I think, is, is uh, yeah. partially accomplishing, you know, uh, because I think intense. that what we've had, what we had <laughs> for uh, probably 40 or 50 years was a pretty beautiful, loving, peaceful, spiritual, creative, artistic uh, culture. And I think that a lot of that's not going to die. We, we've got about 20 seconds. What are your final thoughts? I think you're true on every say, and I think one thing you missed, we changed the world. We really did. I mean, I, this is a big deal. And going into the future and going into where the environment and, uh, and things are happening in the future we all know are coming, what we did here will become only more important. Oh, man. Uh, that's, I think that's a wonderful place to leave this, uh, this, this at. Uh, Rick Cusick, Reefer Dadness, coming out soon. Thank you so much, my brother, for being on the show, man. Thank you so much for having me. I'll talk to you soon, Dave. All right, Hempy Trails. That concludes this Hempy installment Trails. of Hempers on Cannabis Radio. When it comes to prohibition, you've got the right not to remain silent. Activism requires a voice to so find your voice and speak up for justice because resistance is fertile. The Hempers intro music is Joanne Rand, Seven Mile Beach. The outro music is Sticker Bush, Take Back the Plant. See you next week, folks. Stay strong. Marijuana! The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited.